everyone on behalf of mills a student driven initiative of department of management studies it is a pleasant duty to welcome director professor dr bhaskar ramamurthy professor dr a thillai rajan and the honorable chief guest for the evening sadguru yogi mystic and a visionary sadguru is an author poet and a spiritual master with a difference he is the founder of isha foundation an international non profit organization with over 1 million volunteers across the world an arresting blend of profundity and pragmatism his life and work serve as a reminder that yoga is not an esoteric discipline from an outdated past but a contemporary science it is a great honor to have you amongst us we would now have a glimpse of sadguru and isha foundation through a short video
We are sorry for the technical glitch. With great pleasure, we now invite Sadhguru on the dais, along with our three fellow students, Swaminathan, Srinidhi, and Brahmarambika, to facilitate the conversation with Sadhguru. <laughs> I would now request Director Professor Dr. Bhaskar Ramamurthy to come up on the stage and welcome our chief guest for the evening. So sorry. <laughs> I would now request Director Sir to please address the gathering. Very good evening to all those assembled here. We are indeed highly privileged to have with us today Sadhguru to address all our students and campus residents. Sadhguruji, in IIT Madras, we do not give an order to students or anybody to turn up. So everybody who turns up at these, at these uh, uh, events have all turned up because they are very eager to participate and, and uh, hear the speaker and also to ask questions. So I'm very glad at the turnout. And I don't want to take any more time, just, uh, you know, you're all aware that uh, at, at the current time, among many other things, uh, Sadhguru is focused on this rally for rivers. He was just beginning to briefly tell me um, what's, what, you know, the framework under which it's being put together. It's really an awesome uh, exercise. I'm sure he will touch upon that among many other things. So I'd like to, as quickly as possible, hand it over to Sadhguruji and ask him to address the audience and also take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let us now commence with the most awaited conversation of the evening. Over to Swami Nathan. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskar. Thank you for accepting our invitation and coming to IIT Madras Department of Management Studies MBA Invitational Lecture Series. Is it, is it okay? Hello. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and coming down to IIT Madras Department of Management Studies MBA Invitational Lecture Series. We are really blessed and honored by your presence. And we are really excited that we are going to have some lively conversations with you. So with your permission, I would like to start the question and answer session, Sadhguru. <laughs> Over to Srinidhi. Namaste, Sadhguru. So uh, we are aware that you are conducting a lot of workshop for the top business people all over the world. And could you please share your insights on how business leaders should act on social welfare? Is this good enough, the audio, for all of you? What she's speaking? Then you got to say it, huh? not at the end of the conversation. <laughs> Just do yeah. check, check. Huh? Hello? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, uh, I'm saying that in a technological institution, technology failures are happening. It's uh, in the last uh, twenty years, I've been particularly focusing on global business leaders, including many of the top and variety of businesses in India. Why this is uh, because the traditional so-called spiritual always is skeptical about this. Why should a spiritual leader 
be talking to business leaders, be in business meetings, be in work economic forums and those kind of summits. See, we must understand this. Today and for always, it's just people who live off calendars and slogans, they don't understand this. Otherwise, the success of a nation is not in the success of its politics, not in the success of its… even its armies, but it's always in the success of its commerce and its business. In which nation the businesses are doing really well, that nation is doing well, there's no question about it. So when this is the reality of our existence, there was a time two hundred and fifty years ago when everybody wanted to come to India risking their life, you know. All the European expeditions don't think they came here because they were in love with us. Because this was the richest nation, so everybody wanted to come here. But today, if Western nations open up their visas, seventy percent of Indians will swim across the oceans and get there. Why? Because their businesses are successful, ours are not as successful as they should be. Essentially, it's that. So, business is not a bad word in my understanding of life. Business essentially means it's a transaction where both the parties benefit. And in my experience of life, whatever kind of transactions we have, whether they're transactions of marketplace or marriage, both the parties should benefit, otherwise it will not sustain. Yes? So, business is not a bad word at all for me. The business also had this resistance. In 2006 or 2005, don't remember the years, when I first went to World Economic Forum, uh, people were almost resentful. What is a mystic doing in an economic forum? So this one person who spoke to me in a very not so business-like language, <laughs> said, what are you doing here? I said, what's your business? He said, we are the third largest computer-making company. Well, very proudly he said three months later, they were taken over by the Chinese. <laughs> I said, see, it doesn't matter whether you make computers or safety pins, or spacecrafts or cars, it doesn't matter what you make. Essentially, the fundamental business is of human well-being and that's my business too. And that's why I'm here and that's why you're here but you have forgotten your fundamental business. You've gotten up in the process of your uh, quarterly balance sheets and you've forgotten why the hell you're doing this business. Every business that you do is essentially for human well-being, isn't it? Your idea of humanity, maybe just you unfortunately, or just you and your family, or just you and your community, or your idea of humanity, maybe the entire world. The question is only of scale of understanding. But essentially, every business that we are doing in this planet is for human well-being. So such an important business must be conducted in the right way. When I say con must be conducted in the right way, Essentially, any activity with that we do, is it… is it inclusive or is it exclusive? That's the main question. So my effort has been to make the businesses as inclusive as possible. In that particular forum, I coined this word inclusive economics. This is bouncing all over the world, including the prime ministers have been using this word now. Inclusive economics, because economy has to be inclusive, otherwise economy or the process of economics becomes an exploitative process where the corrections will happen in brutal ways later on. Whatever you have seen in the last two centuries as revolutions is just actually economics becoming exclusive and corrections happening in brutal ways on the street. If you don't want that kind of corrections to happen, it is very important that you run the business in an inclusive manner. So that's been my effort, essentially. Thank you, Sadhguru. My next question is on Chennai flood, uh, which we witnessed in December 2015. Chennai? Chennai floods. Oh. 
you're talking like Noah. <laughs> so, almost 280 people lost their lives, almost uh, three, three million people were cut off from basic amenities. Uh, the heavy rainfall caused around three crores worth of damages. I'm not sure if Chennai or Tamil Nadu is prepared to face another situation in the near future. Uh, what needs to be done, Sadhguru? We don't know how to handle a blessing. That's a whole problem. <laughs> when water is something that is super scarce in the country, but we build cities which are not capable of handling even the normal monsoon rains. Not when a cyclonic storm happened, that's different. That's an unusual level of water. When a tsunami came, you can't handle the water, that's a different matter. You can't be prepared for that. But a normal monsoon we are not able to handle in most of the cities, whether you see Mumbai, Mumbai is every year flood, Chennai only once it happened, but it will come to you also because there is simply no planning. We've just building cities like shacks all over the place, whichever way we like, without understanding the topography. Nobody ever built a city even in ancient times without considering the topography of the place. But today we are such brilliant engineers, we have built things without considering the topography. We have built bridges and roads all across the country without considering the topogra topographical issues, as if you can fix it. You can't fix it. The flow of water and many other aspects of soil dynamics and other things are very topographically decisive. So, without considering the topographic aspects, we're just building cities one building at a time, our plan is only one building at a time sanctioned. The entire plan, nobody knows where is that plan. So there is no way we can rip off the city and again put it back, not possible, we are not ready to do that. We have to make corrections. Corrections could be painful for a few people, which we must do. I think some corrections were done, people who are living in the riverbed, you know, they've built in the riverbed, but it's their home. When you demolish this home, it looks very cruel because there's a family living there and they're suddenly out on the street. But if you want long-term well-being, some hard steps are needed. We should be willing to go through some pain if we want long-term well-being. If we don't do those things, we will live like very, you know, for the day kind of people. Again, when it rains or when it floods or when it… something happens, we will always have problems. Now our problem is not a flood, Chennai has only fifty percent of the water that it needs right now. They're saying by 2030 you will have only twenty-two to twenty-five percent of water that you need. That is what you need to bother about, not really flood. Uh, but flood was a very artificial situation in my opinion. I know many people will be angered by this, uh, the administration will be angered by this, but in my opinion, this was a very artificial flood, lot of wrong things being done. It should not rain. <laughs> you want rain or no rain? Are you… Did you come up in the nursery rhymes of rain, rain, go away or… No. We want rain in this country. This is a tropical nation which receives only forty to forty-five days of average rain in the… in the year. We want as much rain as possible. Only thing is we have to build capacity to see how the rainwater goes down into the soil, not flowing into your home. This needs some planning, this needs some correction. Corrections will look cruel when you do it, but later on citizenry will enjoy that. The city will be a good place to live, but uh, they will be painful when we do it. Sadhguru, right in those lines, you are talking about asking people to change the places in which they live. So, how can we make them think about the society? Many of the people are selfish, they think about themselves. So, how can we make them see that it is harming another person? How can we make them see that we have to go to do good to the society? See, it's not about doing good to the society. You must understand there is no such thing as society, there are only human beings. Together we call them a society. If we have to live in a place, if you want to live by your own rules, you must withdraw to the mountains and live by your own rules, but you can't live by your own rules in nature. There, there are other creatures, animals, you have to follow their rules if you want to survive. 
So if you want to survive in a human society, you have to follow those rules which are inclusive and beneficial to all. Otherwise, you become unfit to live in a human society. If you go to the jungle, you must understand when the tiger is… tiger is prowling, you must sit on a tree. If you walk in front of him like this, then you become breakfast. So, wherever you go, there are rules. If you want to play the game, there is a rule. So to live in a city, there are rules. If we don't understand this, then we become unfit to live in human societies. Especially when the society has a concentrated population, everybody has to follow the rules, otherwise every little thing that we do harms somebody else. So we need to understand this. This sense of living in close proximity is a certain challenge. And our cities are very closely packed people. So, how we walk, how we breathe, how we drive, how we throw our garbage, how we use water, everything needs to be calibrated carefully, otherwise nobody can live properly here. Because of population pressure and poverty and variety of other stresses that people are going through, they try to find shortcuts. That is how it is everywhere, believe me. People are, be are like this. This is why we must become a law-abiding nation. Right now, even with the rivers, this is what I'm trying to do. Everybody wants to do things out of their emotion. This is a nation which runs on people's emotion. Anything you say, they want to get into action today. Wherever I go, they say, rally for rivers. Sadhguru, we will plant trees tomorrow. I said, you're not going to plant a single tree. Just shut up and give a missed call. <laughs> because the… what is lacking in the country is a strategy. Emotionally, we do things and it dies down after three days. We have to approach our problems strategically. Right now, Chennai flood as an example, topographical maps are there, all right? If you just see it, we know which are the areas which will have to go. Now, they are not willing to go. So if they are not willing to go, we have to do much more engineering of laying underground pipes and doing things, all this stuff. If this we have to do, there's a cost involved. If this we have to do, if we don't dig out your house, at least maybe we have to dig your garden. You must be ready for that. If you're not ready for that, there must be a law which will anyway do it. But now, if you have to make a law like that, we should not have people who are very nervous about winning the next election or ne winning the next uh, vote, confidence vote. They can't make these laws, they cannot enforce these laws. There must be leadership which is willing to do what is needed for the long-term well-being of the city and the people. This needs some courage and commitment to execute what needs to be executed. Uh, Sadhguru, now uh, I'm going to ask a different question. So… I've, I've seen people copying answers, but you are copying questions. <laughs> So Sadhguru, uh, two major problems we all face are identity crisis and self-doubt. And self-doubt especially plagues us women. So what advice can you give us? Doubt is a very good thing. Only a fool is dead sure of everything, you know? Only idiots are dead sure of what they're doing. Either you must be an idiot or you must be a fanatic, then you're dead sure. Otherwise, every moment there's a doubt about everything. It's a good way to live. Doesn't it conflict with confidence, self-confidence? <laughs> See, uh, we'll come to that. Doubt means you have an active intelligence, constantly looking at everything of all possibilities, because there is nothing here in the world which is hundred percent yes or hundred percent no. You're always looking for pluses and minuses and seeing how to gather more pluses and act. Is there a hundred percent plus in the world or is there a hundred percent minus in the world? There's no such thing. Is there anybody here who is hundred percent plus or hundred percent minus, absolutely wonderful and absolutely nasty? No, they are uh, like that. We generally gauge them and see, okay, in the day how many times they are nasty, whether to be friendly with them or not, we decide, isn't it? Whether it matches with our nastiness or not. Hello? 
See, we… we are not seeking somebody who is absolutely fantastic. We are looking for somebody who has… A, whose nastiness is reasonably like ours, isn't it? Some sense of uh, compatibility for every sort of action that we perform in our life, we are looking for that kind of people. You want to drive with certain kind of people, you want to do business with certain kind of people, you be… you want to be married to certain kind of people, you want to be friends with certain kind of people. What you're looking for is different in all these areas of activity, isn't it? So, this is always there. Only thing is, <clears throat> doubt is good. You must encourage doubt within yourself. Otherwise, you will either become a fanatic or a fool, thinking you have attained to certainty. No, doubt is good, but you must be joyfully confused, okay? If you get confused, you make yourself miserable, that's the problem. If you're joyfully confused like me, you have no issue <laughs> because you constantly nurtured confusion. Now, out of that, after much doubt and considering, considering everything in the universe, slowly clarity arises. Now you talked about confidence. Confidence is a terrible thing because Confidence means without clarity you have attained to certainty. Confidence is the first step towards fanatism. You will see nobody is as confident as a fanatic, isn't it? Because you become a one-track mind, you never question yourself, you never question your actions, you never question your thoughts and emotions, you just become certain. So this kind of certainty is of no use. This will come because you believe something. You simply believe something. Believing something gives you confidence but not clarity. But you will walk through the world, negotiate this world well only when there is clarity, not when there is confidence. Confidence is a way of blundering through life. See, right now, if you want to walk through, let's say one of the rows between two rows, let's say your vision is not clear but you have confidence, what will you do? Hello, please tell her. If somebody whose vision is not clear walks through one of these two… between these two rows, what will they do? They will step on everybody's feet, but they're confident. Right now, this is what is happening. People who believe in absolutism about everything, they are confident. They know they're doing the right thing and going to heaven. It doesn't matter what horrendous things they create. Yes or no? They are dead sure. I'm sorry, they're not dead, unfortunately <laughs> They are so sure that they are going straight to heaven. They know in which direction heaven is, you know, here? Here. But the planet is round, you're sitting approximately at probably twelve degrees latitude and it's spinning, so if you look up, inevitably you're looking up in the wrong direction, that is not something that they will consider. They know this is the way to heaven. But the earth is spinning, always pointing in the wrong direction, isn't it? But they are dead sure because they believe this is it. So confidence is a very bad thing that's been nurtured in people. What you need is clarity. Clarity needs working upon yourself. It will not come simply like that. That you express doubt about everything and consider and consider and consider constantly, slowly cack clarity will arise out of that because you see clearly, you have clarity. Confidence, you don't have to see clearly. Just like that, you believe you're right, then you're confident. Confidence is a terrible substitute for clarity. Please bring clarity into your lives. If you are a confident… oh, you're not an engineering… engineering manager. Manager. If you're a confident manager without clarity, you will be a blundering fool with people. Yes. But if you have clarity, you don't have to claim you're a manager. Everybody will line up behind you to ask what to do next because they see clarity in you. Thank you, Sadhguru. My next question is on courage or bravery. <laughs> As a child, I was… I, I've always heard that three important aspects of life are education, wealth and courage. 
In Tamil, we say Kalvi, Selvam, Viram. So as students of IIT Madras, the education aspect is taken care. Uh, we also believe that the wealth part will be taken care once we graduate from IIT Madras. <laughs> <laughs> courage becomes a question mark. Could you give us some insights on courage? <clears throat> See, uh, when you do something beyond a little bit of reason, you call it courageous. But when somebody else does, does the same thing, we think he's stupid, he's risking his life, okay? When we step back from something, we call it caution. When somebody else step back, we say he's a coward. So this courage business is a very relative thing. What is courage, what is not courage? The question is just this. If you… there are some people who are capable of walking into situations without knowing a thing about it, okay? But whether they can walk out of it or not is a big question mark. Again, I'm going back to the same thing. If you had absolute clarity about everything, you would know how to act in that situation or whatever that is and you would largely know the consequence of that action. If it is a, a calculated effort and you took the action, it may succeed. It may not succeed because there are many factors that you could have overlooked. But if you had enough clarity, the chances of success are much, much better. But if you just have this viram in you too much, okay? and uh, you took steps because you're courageous. When things don't work, others will see that it was the stupidest thing to do. So you must understand, you will be attributed with all kinds of qualities, positive qualities, as long as you're successful. The moment you fail, people will see the same things that they said was courageous, they will say after five years, he is an utter fool what a thing he has done to himself and to everybody. So the important thing is, the purpose of human action is success. It doesn't matter whether it's a big thing or a small thing that you do. If you… don't torture the children, huh? <laughs> uh, if you… If you take any kind of action which produces positive result, then people say you're intelligent, all right? Maybe you're not, maybe it was just chance, but they will say you're intelligent because most of the world is not able to recognize anything other than success. It's not the best way to live, but that is the reality. Today, all over the world, all kinds of universities, especially in United States, they want me to be there, they are asking me to be their professor. I said, I, I avoided university all my life, now you think I'll get trapped in it <laughs> So, this is not because they see who I am. Thirty-five years ago, when I simply sat down in a place, eyes closed, people thought I was a fool. Fifty years ago, when I simply sat, under a tree or upon a tree, without doing anything with my eyes closed. My family thought I'm an utter idiot. What is happening to this boy? He's lost his mind, they thought. My father actually thought I need psycho psychological evaluation because he's simply sitting, not doing anything. But this is what we have done to life, that we are too much result-oriented, not process-oriented. If our processes are right, Results will come, but because we are in such a hurry for results, we are too result-oriented. Because of that, we built these kind of cities, which no process, only I built your… I built my house, you built your house, everybody appreciated, clapped their hands and said, oh, he has gotten his own house. It's a… it's a disaster for the city, but I got my own house, all right? <laughs> So, this excessively success-oriented society is dangerous because 
we will miss all the processes, we will bypass processes and do things, ad hoc it may succeed. See, anything will succeed fifty percent of the time, even if you don't know what the hell you're doing. Yes, if you're playing cricket with your eyes closed also, if you swing the bat, you may hit it, all right? So fifty percent of the time, lot of things may happen by chance, but that is not what young people should depend on. You must build a process within yourself which is reliable. It doesn't matter, somebody approves it, disapproves it, whether the world approves it or disapproves it, whether it appreciates or depreciates, it doesn't matter. You built a solid process for yourself that it's always, always reliable for you. If you do this, if there's an opportunity in the world, maybe it'll become a big success, otherwise maybe it will be something like that, but you will have the beauty of always standing on firm ground within yourself, never struggling with anything that happens to you in your life. This is what you must build. Success in the world will come depending upon what the world is ready for. I was the same person forty years ago, but at that time everybody thought I'm no good. But today they think I'm a great mystic yogi, nonsense, whatever, okay? Because… not because they experience who I am, because everywhere it's recognized, they are also clapping their hands, that's all. So what the flock says, it doesn't matter. Have you built an appropriate process which has absolute integrity within itself and clarity is the basis of your process? If you have done this, it doesn't matter whether the world accepts you or not, you are successful because as a human being you're successful. You are successful in the world or not depends on what the world is ready for right now. So, uh, Why are you clapping? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Near-death experience is a phenomenon by which we hear that uh, the memories of previous births are awakened and uh, people gain extrasensory perceptions. As a person, uh, since you have undergone a near-death experience, can you please… When did I die? <laughs> no, like uh, we read that you… a snake bit you and you had… Uh, oh, that was not near-death. <laughs> so, okay, then can you share what near-death experience is to us and how it awakens consciousness within us? If you have… Uh, anybody from Varanasi here? Oh, only one. There is something called as Bhairavi Yatana. Have you heard about this? This is when a person… Are you ready for something like this? This is a management school, I thought. Hello? Are you all interested in this question? Only the older people are raising their hands because they are near death one way or the other <laughs> Because uh, why I'm asking this question whether we should speak about it or not is, aspects like this about our life need to be properly looked at. If we… if I try to give you a two-minute answer, it'll become frivolous and you'll make wrong conclusions. Either you will believe it or disbelieve it, that's no good. But it's in the intrinsic nature of the way life is built. See. I'm sorry, I'm not getting your name. Srinidhi, sir. Srinidhi. Lot of wealth <laughs> out of the three qualities. What are you? Viran, eh? Swaminathan, sir. Okay <laughs> No, I thought those three qualities you got here, I was wondering <laughs> See, you are the person that you are. You are different from this person. What is it? What is the difference? What is it that makes the difference? The kind of experiences that I have had… Memory, essentially memory, right? So your memory is your person. Your memory is not just what you remember consciously. Do you remember how your great, 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 great grandmother looked like? No, but her nose is sitting on your face. Yes or no? Your body remembers or no? Your body remembers 
how your forefathers looked a million years ago. So there is genetic memory, there is evolutionary memory, there is elemental memory, there is atomic memory, and there is karmic memory, and there is articulate and inarticulate memories. Like this, there are many levels of memory. In yoga, we identify eight forms of memory. These… all these memories put together, you are the person that you are. All of them are interplaying with each other. You may not be conscious what is kicking in. Right now, at this stage in your life, it may so happen, I'm not saying essentially for you, but for anybody, you're eighteen. You look at your mother or father and say, no, I'm never going to be like that, all right? But you become forty-five, you will see, you will walk like your mother, you will sit like your mother, you will talk like your mother. This happens to any number of people, ask the older lot. Because the genetic memory is overpowering your conscious memory. Unless you have consciously done something to yourself, you will see the genetic memory and the karmic memory will overpower everything that you are doing consciously unless you have created a certain level of awareness within you that you have distanced yourself from your genetics. In this culture, there are processes, if somebody dies, we are doing various karmas, he's from Varanasi. Kriyas and karmas are being done every year, first eleven days and then every year, this is not in memory of them. This is to distance yourself from their memory. We are trying to keep a genetic distance from their memory because if you allow their memory to function within you, you will not have a life of your own. Unknowingly, your mother, your grandmother, your father, your grandfather, all of them will start living through you. If you want to be a fresh life, you must distance yourself. When they're alive, we love them, we respect them, everything fine. The moment they are dead, we want to distance ourselves from them. This is a very conscious culture, but unfortunately people think yearly once they are overeating, thinking they are doing this in memory of their father. No, this entire process was created to create a distance from the dead. Someone else somewhere far away said two thousand years ago when he said, come follow me, when people said, my father… If somebody said, my father is dead, he said, leave the dead to the dead. It looks most uncompassionate statement, but he is saying something very profound when he says, leave the dead to the dead. If you don't leave the dead dead, they will live through you. This is the nature of life. So only a human being is able to leave the dead to the dead. For all other creatures, anyway it will play through them. Even in the human being, if they're not conscious, it will play through them. So this phenomenal amount of memory, which is incredible levels of memory because… See, if you… what do you like, mango or banana? Mango. Mango. If you eat a mango, it goes inside and becomes a woman. If he eats a mango, it goes inside, becomes a man. If a cow eats a mango, it goes inside and becomes a cow. Very smart mango, you think? No, there is memory here. Whatever enters this body, it is… make sure it becomes masculine. There is memory here which makes it… See, just because you started eating not mangoes from Tamil Nadu, you started eating mangoes from Uttar Pradesh, your nose will not grow, your complexion will not change, it will not happen. It doesn't matter what is the intake, there is absolute memory within you which determines how it should be transformed. So this memory is a possibility, it makes you who you are. At the same time, memory is also a boundary. It will not let you cross that. See, I remember this much means, what does it mean? I am living within that memory boundary, isn't it? So your genetic memory, your evolutionary memory and every other kind of memory, especially the karmic memory, is a possibility which allows you to do many things unthinking. If you… you know, many things you can do, you know how to eat rasam rice, unthinking, isn't it? You ask… Uh, here there are some Chinese, Lee is sitting here, you ask her to eat rasam rice, whatever she does, it will spill all over the place, it will not go into her mouth. Because there is memory, simply you can eat like that. But somebody else tries such a simple act, it won't work. She will eat with two sticks, you try, it will go and hit the ceiling. Because 
all this memory is built in. I'm not only talking about memory that you built by practice, there is memory which is beyond practice. Like, you will walk in a certain way without knowing why. If we look at you, you're walking half a mile away, if we look at the way you swing your hand, we know it's you. There are 7.3 billion people, but you have a unique way of swinging your arm, isn't it? So, the memory is built into you, it is both a possibility and a limitation. This is the entire goal of yoga, to go in the direction where you touch an intelligence within you, which is beyond memory, because beyond memory means beyond boundaries also. How do you know somebody here, this is your friend and this is somebody that you do not know, that is your enemy, that is a person you like and that's a person you don't like, how do you know? Just your memory, isn't it? So all your boundaries are drawn by your memory. So boundary… the memory is both a possibility and a limitation. So when the moment of leaving this body comes, don't believe all this, okay? You must experience it. When the moment of leaving this body comes, the memory goes into an overdrive. It is not about past lives or whatever, this is called as Bhairavi Yathana. To conduct this consciously, that's why people who are on the… who are near death or people who are become old enough and they think they must die at some point and they know they will die, they all move to Kashi at one time because they want to conduct this Bhairavi Yathana consciously so that this… they can become free from this memory. If you become free from his memory, memory means repetitiveness. If you become free from your memory, all repetitiveness is gone. From com compulsiveness to consciousness you have moved. So this is being interpreted in the West in so many crazy ways. Generally these books are written, everybody is claiming they had near death because those books sell well. In America, if you want to become a millionaire, you just have to say, I almost died. And I floated and they see angels, this is all cultural nonsense. You will see Shiva Parvati floating, they will see angels, this is all cultural stuff. But memory will go on an overdrive for sure for everybody. Thank you, Sadhguru. Next, we would like to have rapid fire questions. We would like to have some short and sweet answers from you. Okay. I was not sweet all this time. Sorry. You are. <laughs> First question What is the best gift? What is the best gift? To give to somebody or yes. to receive? <laughs> Any. <laughs> give one for both. Huh? Give one for both. I'm sorry? Give and one to take. Oh. Clarity is the best gift to receive and the best to give also because once you have clarity, you will see it is of highest value to you and you would love to have people around you also who have some clarity <laughs> So even if you give clarity to other people, it is not a gift to them, it's a gift to yourself because having people with some clarity around you is the greatest gift that you can have living in the world. <laughs> Biggest sorrow? I don't know, because I've never had one. <laughs> and uh, can I make it a little dirty? Okay, because you wanted it sweet, so on. <laughs> See, what is a joy, what is a sorrow? is completely your psychological drama. If you are the director of your psychological drama, would you want a joyful drama or a miserable drama? Joyful. Joyful. If you have left your drama uncontrolled, then so many things are happening and you think they are real. Your sorrow and your joy both made up by you. So if you're making it up consciously, you enjoy tragedies, please enjoy what's my problem. But whether you go through misery or through joy, it's your psychological drama, isn't it? Your psychological drama should be conducted by you and you and only you. Nobody else but you must direct your psychological drama, isn't it? 
Other people may decide a few things that happen around us. Nobody should decide what happens within me. The moment somebody can decide what happens within you, you are into a deep level of slavery. Waste of time. Hmm? Something that is waste of time. Oh. There is no waste of time. Some people like to do a lot of things, some people don't like to do anything. But both for action and inaction, there is a consequence. If they know the consequence and they're doing it, I bow down to them. But if they don't know the consequence or they're doing nothing, then we have to pinch them a little bit. Never miss, hmm? never miss dash. Never miss life. That's the only thing you can have and that's the only thing you can miss. The only thing you can have is life here, there's nothing else. And the only thing you can miss also is life. There is nothing else you can really have. See, right now I drink water, I think I'm having water. No, I'm drinking life, isn't it? Having a conversation, this is life. Either you can have life or miss life. So don't miss life, because that's all you got. What is the toughest thing to do? Toughest thing to do? Toughest thing to do? You can make anything very tough for yourself or you can do anything playfully. If you… if you become too serious about who you are, then everything becomes difficult. If you carry yourself lightly, then everything is with ease. There is nothing really tough or easy. It is the way people experience it that something becomes very tough or something becomes a joyful process. If you make light of yourself, life will never sit heavy upon your heart, it will be light. But you think too much of yourself, everything will become difficult. Sitting, standing, somebody looked at you like this, so much difficulty, isn't it? Somebody did not look at you, so much difficulty. This is because you have made yourself bigger than what you are. You have ideas about yourself, exaggerated ideas about yourself. See, this is the biggest problem with humanity. You okay? It's not short enough. <clears throat> See, this cosmos, in this vast cosmos, this solar system is a speck. In that speck, planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, Chennai is a super micro speck. In that super micro spec, IIT campus is a super, super, super micro spec. In that you are a big man. <laughs> this is a serious problem. It's a serious lack of perspective. Now in this everything will become tough. If you understand you are a microscopic nothing here, then it's very easy to pass through this life. Whatever we can do, we will do. What we can do, we will do. What we cannot do, we will not do. That's all there is to life. But Sadhguru, have you never had a moment of revo uh, what, remorse or sadness ever? I told you, I direct my drama. Once in a way, if I like… You know, I, I, I used to uh, write scripts for… in my college days. I used to modernize Shakespearean drama for today… with today's language because most people wouldn't get Shakespearean language. So I would rewrite it for, with modern language, doing our own wacky thing with Shakespeare. So, uh, you, if you want to enjoy a tragedy, you can enjoy one. But I have not allowed this, I have… I have kept the privilege of what happens within me to myself, I have not given this to anybody. Because of that, what happens within me happens the way I want it. What happens around me doesn't happen the way I want it most of the time. People, wonderful people around me striving hard to make it happen the way Sadhguru wants, but it doesn't happen that way. Because what I want, is always climbing notches. If they do well, I'll climb up. If they do better, I'll climb up further. So it'll never happen. 
situations in my life will never happen the way I want it because I keep ramping it up all the time. They're doing great things, but I keep ramping it up, so always I'm disappointed with what's happening, but joyfully disappointed. Thank you, Sadhguru. I'm sure many from the audience are looking forward to ask you some questions. So with your permission, I would like to hand it over to the audience. Hello? Hello? I have two clarifications from you, Sadhguru. First thing is, <clears throat> India from time immemorial has been producing a lot of philosophers, you know, social reformers like you. Really? Then, how can I say, how can I evaluate you that you don't belong to Ram Rahim category? That's first question. <laughs> and uh, my second question is, my second question is... So let me finish one, eh? Pardon? Let me finish one question. Pardon, sir? Let me finish one question. Okay. You don't like the answer, just the question? <laughs> because after that, I may not get chance. <laughs> but this Ram Rahim mic. thing will finish it. <laughs> okay. okay, then wait. <laughs> so... Uh, you said uh, India has produced many s philosophers and social refor reformers from time immemorial. I think you got it completely wrong on that note because India never produced social reformers or philosophers. Philosophy is one thing we always shunned. This is a land that always focused on nurturing human consciousness. This is why we look like such a big chaos, but still we manage. The entire world wonders, how the hell does India function? Yes, we are like a swarm of bees, we are going all over the place, but still going in one direction. Because in this land, nobody could ever give us a moral code. Even when so-called divine entities came, all they got was a debate, yes or no? When Shiva came, his wife Parvati asked a thousand questions. Entire Shiva Sutra is full of questions and questions and questions. He can't give a commandment and say, this is it. He has to explain, this is not a philosophy, this is a seeking. This has been always a land of seekers. When Krishna came, Arjuna, his dearest friend, how many questions? Endless amount of questions. Nobody could ever give a commandment or a moral code in this country because here we believed the best thing is to stir up your humanity, not your morality. By fixing a moral code, today it looks like everything is in order, but tomorrow people will find a way to subvert the moral code and do their own thing anyway. The best way to bring about a certain order in the society is to stir up one's humanity. But if you give a moral code, it's a one day's job. You can carve it on the rock and say, this is it forever. But if you want to stir up humanity, you can't do it to a crowd. You have to do one at a time, one at a time. It's a lifelong commitment to people around you. About… I don't know what you know about that… Uh, I don't know what to say about him. <laughs> but at the same time, I want to tell you this. This country has produced the most phenomenal sages. Sages with incisiveness of mind and consciousness, that if you come after ten thousand years, till it makes sense what they said many thousand years ago. You are not looking at them. Right now, you have unfortunately come to a stage where your idea of a sage is Ram Rahim, because you have a silly idea of secularism, he exploited it with Ram Rahim. Your idea of secularism is Am Amar Ak Akbar Antony, 
So he became Ram Rahim, I don't know why he's not Robert also, he did not add <laughs> So, see this is what I said. Today because a court has convicted him, everybody is standing up and saying, this is the most evil man. The first day I saw him on a news channel, the obscenity of the aesthetics itself, I said, why is even a national news channel showing this kind of thing? Obviously if you pay money, this whatever God business, what is the movie on? What is… he made one movie, no? No, no, he made a movie, right? Ram Rahim made a movie. What is that? Messenger of God. Ah. When he made this movie, then only you should have known the moment you saw the man. Now because the court has convicted, all of you are doing this. I said it the first day, this is a joke being played upon our society. You must stand up and say something. But no, all the news channels, all the intellectuals, everybody clapped their hand because they liked the garish nature of what he's doing. But today because a court is convicted, they are saying this, this must go because first of all, this is the thing. When the court was to give a judgment, their people went about creating arson around the court. Why are they doing this? Because they believe and many times unfortunately it's worked this way, that they can force the hand of law with violence or some force on the street. That's the reason why they're doing it. Similarly, many news channels are also believing by creating a certain force of opinion, they can force the hand of law. This must stop. If we want to become a law-abiding nation, our opinion should not be bigger than the law. Law should be the ultimate thing. So here, one thing is law, which is between you and me, because law is about how all of us can fun function together in the society. But another thing is how I am within myself. How I am within myself must happen by evoking my humanity, not by fixing morality on me. But if you want to evoke humanity, we need many people who are dedicated to that. I think it was very beautifully put when Adi Shankara spoke about it. He said, every one of you have tasted a mango, but all of you have not planted a mango tree. Because ten people planted mango trees, thousand people are eating mangoes, the sweetness of mango they know. So these people, those ten people for every thousand were there in the past, unfortunately they're missing. So here we are at a… a kind of a flux in the society right now, where we have no morality and where we have nobody to stir up our consciousness, not enough at least. So you are facing the kind of dilemma you are facing, all kinds of people are cropping up and filling that space. Just because you found one Ram Rahim, don't try to paint the entire clan black because they don't belong to the same clan, you must understand. Every sage, every seer, every yogi who came, he came absolutely as an individual. Maybe he was spawned by a certain tradition, but when he stood up, he stood up on his own, didn't, on his own clarity of perception. Those scholars who quote scriptures and other things are different, but every yogi, every mystic, every sage and seer who came always stood on their own clarity and people who saw the clarity went to them, those who did not, did not go to them. How Ram Rahim things become popular, it is like a cinema thing, okay? It's like somebody becomes a star simply because of some commercial movie or whatever they do and the same thing ha is unfortunately happening in this sphere of life also because people are so starved out, there is no sense anywhere. They're trying to make sense out of something because we don't have a moral code, because we don't have one book to follow and it's a great thing we don't have one book to follow or fight for. But at the same time, there is a big chasm in the country, there's no morality and there is no consciousness. If consciousness had we stirred up, there is lot of work to do. 
If moral code has to be given, it's very easy. Ten things we can write down and say, this is it, anyway nobody will follow it, outside they will pretend, within themselves they do what they have to do. So, today it happens unfortunately, I'm walking on the street, Indian people, Chennai people, they will say, show to their children and say, see Santa Claus, <laughs> okay? What's happened to your brains? You did not say, see Agastyamuni, you did not say, see what he looks like Vashishta, you did not say he looks like this yogi or that yogi, you say Santa Claus because the British left seventy years ago, but your brains went with them. It's time you retrieve that. <laughs> One more clarification, sir. I am uh, proud to say that uh, IIT Madras is the uh, only organization, uh, IIT is in, the, in our country, which is offering uh, spirituality in management. You know, I'm really proud of it, you know, proud of this IIT. And uh, when the gentleman asked you a question that how to build up the courage, uh, I expected a straightforward answer from you, but oh. he gave something different, you know. Uh, that is, courage, if you you know, work in tune with uh, nature will automatically get courage. That type of answer, spiritual answer I expected, but he gave something different. Can you explain, please? <laughs> if I do only what you expect, why would I be needed here? <laughs> and uh, tell me, right now, Daytime, I'm asking the girls, daytime you're walking, either in the campus or in the Chennai streets, where you can see everything clearly, there is clarity in your vision. Do you need courage? No. No. Night, one o'clock in the morning, you're walking back to the campus, it's dark. Now you need courage. Why? Because there is no clarity, that's all. Sir, but doesn't that also depend upon what I'm seeing? I am seeing, but what if I'm seeing something that… Even if you're not seeing anything, the more you don't see, the more fearful you become, the more courage, need for courage comes, isn't it? But if you're seeing things very clearly, if there's total clarity of vision, there is no need for courage because clarity will carry you across. It's my vision, my blessing for all the young people in this country, that it is your clarity that carries you across in your life, not stupid courage or confidence. Excuse me, sir, what is your belief of God? What if I don't have one? Uh, what is your belief of God? I said, what if I don't have a belief? We should… if you do a mistake, what do you do? I'll correct it. Uh, if you can't, if you are unable to correct, if you are unable to correct… I know some things can't be fixed. I've learned that much with this much age. There are certain things I can't fix sometimes. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Uh, you said intelligent people uh, do what they like uh, and uh, genius mm -hmm. people do just what is necessary. But it's not always clear just what is necessary. So how does one know or is enlightenment a prerequisite for <laughs> knowing? If that is the case, so how do we get out of the catch-22 situation that one is in? Thank you. Have you read catch-22? Seen the movie at least? No? Oh, you're another generation. In our generation, there was literally nobody who did not read catch-22. So, anyway, let me not go into that. That's a piece of literature that you must read because in any situation, if you allow yourself, you can be confused in any situation. In any situation, if you're willing, you can bring some clarity. That clarity may not be absolute, but at least in a limited way you can bring clarity, work through that and then see what is the next level to work upon. So about intelligence doing what they like, I meant. 
See, if you're doing even what you don't like, this is a very unintelligent way of existence, isn't it? Because right now if you sit here and doing something that you don't like, inevitably you're going to suffer every moment of your life. Is there anything more unintelligent that you have decided that every moment of your life should be misery? So if you have some working intelligence, then you make sure you do the things that you like. But if really if your intelligence flowers beyond likes and dislikes, I'm saying this, should I go into it technically? Why… how it can happen? I thought… I thought you were not engineers, you're only managers. <laughs> hmm? You've been through engineering? Oh, okay. See, there are four… <coughs> in English language, when we say mind, it's just one thing. In yoga, we look at human intelligence as sixteen parts. These sixteen parts we can categorize as four s segments. These four segments are buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means your intellect. I'm going to ask you one question, all of you must say yes or no, I'm going to bless you with that. Would you like your in, in, uh, buddhi or your intellect to be sharp or blunt? Okay. So it is essentially a cutting instrument. If you have a sharp intellect, you can dissect everything that you see and kind of figure out what it is about. Dissection is one way of learning about things. If you give this flower to a scientist, first thing is he will open it up and he will understand the structure of the flower and various aspects of the flower. But one thing is, he will miss the flower completely. But with dissection, we have understood and learned many, many things. So if I really want to know you, I should dissect you. You're not willing? <laughs> Even the frog that you dissected in high school, it was not willing, but you still dissected because you thought it's a great education, but the frog did not think so. So dissection is one way of learning. Your intellect, as you said, you want it sharp because it's a scalpel that can cut through things and show you… reveal certain things to you. But if you want to put things together, you need to sew something. Suppose you want to stitch something and you still use a knife, now you leave everything in tatters. This is the main struggle of modern societies because they're employing their intellect to handle everything in their life. If you employ just your intellect to handle everything, you will see every aspect of your life will become a mess because intellect is a specific tool to be used for a certain purpose. There was a time, you know, when I was crisscrossing India on my motorcycle, just some fortune, because of this rally of… rally for rivers, once again I am on the motorcycle in some of the cities, <laughs> not in Chennai because it's a very serious place <laughs> So when I was crisscrossing criss on the motorcycle, I… I never trusted any mechanic, I always fix my own engine, my own things, because you are on the road and you want a reliable machine, but sometimes, if you stopped in a local mechanic somewhere, there were some… these days things have changed. There were some mechanic shops, he's actually running a professional place. All he's got is a chisel and a hammer. These are only two tools here he has. With this he opens everything and fixes everything. Only thing is afterwards nobody else can open it or close it <laughs> because he used his chisel and hammer on everything. So, this is like that right now, our modern education systems have become such that intellect is the only dimension of intelligence that we are employing. With this, you can cut everything, but you can't put things together. You will not know life at all. It looks like you know… you know about it, but you cannot know it. You will not experience the beauty of being alive if you intellectually analyze everything 
you will see the parts of it. You can cut it into million parts and you can cut this flower into million parts and know many things that a butterfly does not know. But you do not know the joy of sitting on the flower like a butterfly or seeing the butterfly, this flower or smelling the flower or experiencing the flower as a piece of life. That will not be there because intellect is essentially a cutting instrument. Behind this is what is called as ahankara, which usually unfortunately people think is ego. It's not ego, it's your identity. Your identity is your limitation. Your identity decides how your intellect functions. Right now, let us say you identify yourself strongly, I'm a man. Now the way you think is always about your masculinity. Now you say, I'm a woman. Now your intellect functions only to protect that identity or you say, I'm an Indian or a Pakistani or I'm this or, or that, thousand different identities of caste, creed, this, that, rich, poor, all kinds. Whatever you identify with, your intellect will only serve that identity. You won't even know what you're doing. You think you're doing the right thing. Everybody thinks you're a fool, but you think you're the right thing because your identity makes your intellect function that way. So in this culture, we evolved a thing that before we give education to a child, first thing is we must bring a universal identity. Aham Brahmasmi, we taught them. This means a cosmic identity because before, before empowering somebody with education and knowledge, they must have as large an identity as possible because small identities are the basis of all evil and all crime. See, I want you to understand this. If suppose, I, I'll take the worst example because I'm always uh, known to take these risks. Let's take the worst example, Adolf Hitler. Suppose Adolf Hitler, instead of having a limited identity, had a global identity. What a fantastic leader he would have been. Yes or no? No, you don't want to say yes because you're scared. <laughs> I want you to look at this. It is the limited identity which is making that man do such horrendous things. Every crime, every tyrant, every nonsense that we have done on this planet is a consequence of limited identity, isn't it? I am Indian, you are Pakistani, that's why even if I don't know you, I can kill you. I don't know a thing about you, but I want you dead for some reason, because my identity is like this. So it is this identity, different levels of identity that the more limited our identity, more tyrannical our actions are. Man as efficient as Adolf Hitler, if he had a identity with the whole humanity, tch, what a great leader we would have had. But his identity is limited and see what horrendous thing his efficiency did. Yes or no? I wish we had leaders who had that level of efficiency but with a larger identity. It's a very risky thing to say, but I'm saying this because we must understand what you think is evil is seeping out of your limited identification. All that's evil, all that's crime on this planet is a consequence of limited identification, that's all it is. So this identity has not been worked at all in this so-called modern societies. In ancient societies in this country, we always worked on the identity of the person first, before we empowered them with education, a cosmic identity you must have so that your intellect does not work against somebody. Your intelligence should not become a det detrimental factor in the world, that's important, isn't it? Right now you just see the highest level of science and technology, what is it used for? The first use is always military use, isn't it? Why? Because of limited identity. So before empowering a child with education and knowledge, first thing is we must fix his ahankara, what kind of ahankara he has, which we have not done for which we are paying a price. As humanity gets more and more empowered with technology, you will see more and more pain will cre create to each other because limited identification. The next dimension of intelligence is referred to as manas. Manas means it is a silo of memory. This is what we were talking some time ago. Eight forms of memory are there in this, I will not go into it once again. But your intellect is absolutely useless if it is not connected to the memory. 
If I wipe out your memory, even if you have a very sharp intellect, there is nothing you can do, isn't it? It's only empowered by this memory and the type of identity that you have will connect you to the memory in a particular way. If your identity is universal, it will connect you to the memory in one way. If your identity is limited, it will connect you to the memory in a completely different way. The same memory will function in a completely different way and find action in a totally different dimension simply because identity is different. These are three dimensions of intelligence which normally in function for most people. The fourth dimension of intelligence is referred to as chitta. Chitta means it's a dimension of intelligence which is not unsullied by memory. There is no iota of memory in this, it's pure intelligence. If you touch this dimension of intelligence in the yogic culture, very mischievously it is said like this, if you touch your chitta, God will become your slave. Everything works for you. You can play with life, but life will work for you, the source of life will work for you because you have touched a dimension of intelligence which is beyond memory. Why is it important is your individuality comes only because of your limited memory. So in yogic culture, we've always been taught to identify with our ignorance, never with our knowledge. If you… whatever amount of knowledge you have gathered, it is very limited compared to this cosmic space, isn't it? What is there in this creation? It doesn't matter what kind of a manager you are, what kind of an engineer you are, what you know is very minuscule, but your ignorance is boundless. If you identify with your ignorance, you will never go against anybody. If you identify with your knowledge, if I have a different kind of knowledge, you will be naturally against me. But you are identified with your ignorance, you are never against anybody and it's a boundless space. Is your ignorance limited? Hello? It's limitless, isn't it? But is your knowledge limited? Doesn't matter if you read all the libraries on the planet, you are still a very limited knowledge. So, the way we are employing human intelligence is, if there were four wheels in a car, you drive only on one wheel. This is going to be very stressful and nobody can be with you. This is why more intellectual you get, the more you can't get along with anybody. Is this happening? And the more intellectual you get, not intelligent, the more intellectual you get, the longer your face becomes. You can't smile, smile is a big effort. I was speaking to a group of people at the Princeton University. There were two hundred fifty people and they were all… Only three, four lively faces were there. Then I looked at them and said, what's happened to all of you? All these people over thirty years of age, why are they carrying such long faces? One lady stood up and said, they're all married <laughs> I thought people are getting married to multiply their joy. If they're getting married to multiply their misery, there has to be a law against it, then I have to rally for… Yes, some of the girls never got a chance, please. No. Sadhguru, you told about clarity. If you go from the literature of self-help, everyone talks about self-belief, but in a small amount of time after some period, that self-belief turns to ignorance. So how did, you, did we develop conscious self-belief through uh, any process? Okay. <laughs> That question is a little tricky. You said self-belief leads to ignorance, but then you're asking again how to develop self-belief. Consciously, because uh, if self-belief is on a longer period without consciousness, it converts to ignorance because we feel blind and… See, are you for real? Are you real? Sorry? A are you real, I'm asking? Subjective, sir, yes. Oh, I'm asking do you exist? <laughs> yes. Yes. No doubt about it. Only problem is you do not know the nature of your existence. If you had doubt about your existence itself, that is a different level of problem, okay? That's a different thing. 
But now you know that you exist, only thing is you do not know the nature of your existence. Please sit down, it's okay. And uh, for a long time, people have been saying, I believe in God. But from there we have descended to a place, I believe in myself. Believe in… believing in anything is bad enough. Believing in yourself is a total disaster because you must understand the word belief. It's all connected to this uh, courage, confidence stuff. See, how many of you believe? How many of you believe that you have two hands? All such people just raise one hand, please. One will do, one will do, one will do. Okay. Do you believe that you have two hands or do you know that you have two hands? You know that you have two hands, isn't it? Suppose somebody starts an overwhelming argument with you that you have no hands and if their argument becomes too overwhelming, one slap in the face, <laughs> he knows you got hands. But you believe in God, you believe in something else, so many other things you believe, why? Because you're still not straight enough to admit what I do not know as I do not know. I do not know is a tremendous possibility. Only when you see I do not know, the possibility of knowing and the seeking towards that knowing and the pursuit of wanting to know will begin to happen within you and the possibility of knowing can become realized one day if your pursuit is right. But everything that you do not know, you believe. You can call this belief or you can just call it bullshit, okay? Because you're making up things. People do not know what the hell is happening within themselves or around themselves, but they know the entire geography of heaven. I don't understand if they know it, the place so well and it's so fantastic, why they're not gone? Yes? See, they're always talking about a fantastic place elsewhere. They must be gone, why are they waiting here? No, no, because when it comes to real things, they know it's all bullshit. But on a daily basis, they carry it on. Can you… all of you young people, can you come to this level of sincerity? What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Can you do this to yourself? If you can't be straight with anybody else, at least this… with this one person, be absolutely straight. Believe me, life pays off in a huge way. Life will pay you in a very huge way because you're simply absolutely straight with yourself. About what kind of professions you will take, I don't know how many things you have to do with other people, I will leave that to you. But at least with this one person, you must be absolutely, absolutely straight. If this one thing you do, you will see life will give you dividends that other people have not dreamt of. Most people do not know what is integrity, they're innocent of integrity because they go on doing this all the time. What they know, they know, what they do not know, they believe. Why don't you see what I know, I know, what I do not know, I do not know. Is this okay? Hello? Hello? Now not only believing what is up there, now what is inside, you better know what is inside, why do you believe this? What is this thing about I believe in myself? This is very American stuff. I believe in myself. Why should you believe in yourself? You should know yourself, isn't it? Hello? We will take one last question. Good evening, sir. So, uh, my question is… Where are you, ma'am? Okay. okay. Uh, sir, uh, what do you think of um, the proximity that a religion and um, good work or good faith have in our country in the sense that if someone turns up at my parents' place, for example, and he affiliates himself with the religious organization rather than um, a, just a normal secular or nameless organization, 
my parents are more likely to give him money for charity or whatever if he belongs to that. And um, secondly, do you think this has something to do with our tendency to not question authority figures as a whole? Like, ever since I've been a child, I've been um, told to keep my voice down or to keep quiet when I question something or question an authority figure. See, uh, you must first of all understand a question a question is essentially a tool to dig deeper, to know something. That's why we question. So you must look into yourself and see because I don't want to make a judgment about your home situation. You must look into yourself and see, are you asking a question to know or is your question a way of making a commentary on somebody else? This is something you must be clear about. As far as I'm concerned, a question is a tool to dig deeper and know something more than what we know right now. If you want to make a comment, make a comment. Why are you making a comment in the form of a question? Don't do that because the sanctity of a question will go away. A question is a tremendous thing. To come up with the right question, it will take a lot of intelligence. Yes? To come up with the right question which will take you to the next step of your life, takes a certain amount of consideration. So do not sully the question. Questioning should not be seen as arrogance. Questioning is seen as arrogance because people are using questions to make comments. So within yourself you clear that. And if your question is a genuine question, you must definitely ask the question. Because a question is a progress that humanity makes. This is why I said, all the scriptures in this culture are full of questions, no commandments. You must see the kind of questions Parvati is asking Shiva, endless amount of questions. Even today in twenty-first century, most wives would not dare ask questions like that. Yes, that is the kind of questioning she is doing because this is a genuine question she is asking because she wants to know. She is not asking because she wants to comment about him. She is asking because she genuinely wants to know and he sees that, honors that, respects that and answers every question to the best possible way. And certain questions which cannot be answered verbally, he puts her into a process of experience. So, I do not know who comes uh, to your home and what is the situation, but just because you said, what can, why can't we be normal and secular? Who said secular is normal? Let's understand the word secular. Secular means everybody has the right to do what they want and we respect that. Secular does not mean you give up everything that belongs to this culture and do what the English did and we think we are secular. No, I want you to understand <laughs> I want you to understand, even today in the United States of America or UK, from where we think we imported our democracy, even today without taking the name of their God, whatever God they believe in, nothing is done. President takes oath in the name of God, not in India. In India we take oath in the name of the constitution. <clears throat> This is a… this is an incident that happened that Advaniji shared in public. He was saying, when he was just an MP and all the MPs were invited to UK, and one of the events was a dinner with the Queen. Advaniji was sitting next to Siddharth Shankar Ray, who is no more, I think. And everybody is assembled, queen is sat down, prime minister sitting down, dinner is served but everybody is waiting. So Siddharth Shankar is hungry, he asks Advani, what's happening, what are we waiting for? Queen is here, prime minister is here, why don't we eat? So Advani told him, this is not India, this is UK, the priest has to come and bless the food, till then you can't eat it. I'm saying, we are 
misunderstanding secularism as a way of become irreverent towards everything. No, secularism does not mean that. Secularism means we respect everybody's way of life. We don't think our way is superior to somebody else's ways. But we choose a certain way because we think it's better. But if somebody has to prove that is better, we are always willing to debate endlessly. There's an entire culture in Tamil Nadu where Tamil Nadu's population and especially the king shifted from Buddhism to Jainism, Jainism to Shaivism, Shaivism to Jainism, again back to Shaivism, depending upon the sages of the time, they sat down and debated. In the debate, if the Jains convinced that this is the way, best way to do it, this will lead to better life, they all converted. And next, another generation, another sage came and that sage proved being on the Shaiva way of life is the best way to do it, everybody converted back to that. I think this is fantastic, this is what should happen. What really makes sense today, we should all do that. If somebody shows us better sense tomorrow, we will do that. Why are we stuck with this or that? Because you fixed your identity, that's the whole thing, isn't it? If your identity was not fixed, you would always be looking for what is most sensible. So just because whoever that man or woman who comes to your house, maybe they're dressed in a particular way, they belong to a certain creed or whatever, what you should do is, you should listen, do they make sense or don't make sense? Even if they don't make sense to you, maybe they're making sense in a way that you don't understand. So that is when you must ask questions. Questions not to denigrate them, questions because you're longing to know what is the truth. If you are clear that your only goal is that you want to know the truth about life, you want to constantly move from confusion to clarity. If this is very, very clear to you, this is all you intend to do. You are not interested whether somebody is right or wrong. You want to constantly move to higher and higher levels of clarity and truth within yourself. Then you can question anybody you want. You can ask me questions, no problem. Namaskar Sadhguru uh, actually I want to know what is the duration of human birth cycle? What is that? Duration of human birth cycle and how does it affect the uh, next birth, the good karma and bad karma? How the shawl records the bad karma and good karma? Where are you? Oh, oh, okay. Because somebody announced that was the last question. <laughs> Okay. Sorry for that. No, 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 please. Yeah, so I want to know what is the duration of human birth cycle and how it does affect the next birth, like when people say the good karma will affect in next birth and bad karma will affect in ne next birth. Well… And how our shawl re uh, record that the bad karma and good karma? And uh, like you gave the example of a kid. Like uh, in starting itself, the baby should… baby have the uh, ego kind of thing, right? So how it can happen without teaching the ego this thing or something like that? Oh, okay. Say, uh, let's understand this word karma. Karma means action. Is it true as you sit here, your physical body is doing some action, you must say yes or no. Yes. Hello? Yes. Is it true your mental action also is happening? Yes. Some level of emotional action also happening? Yes. Some level of energy also in activity. So there are four dimensions of karma that you're performing every moment of your life, both in wakefulness and sleep. Four dimensions of karma are functioning. Now, depending on what type of karma you are performing right now, karma need not necessarily mean you have to go and do something. You sitting here, what kind of thought process you have? Does it not determine how your evening will be? Forget about next life. Is it true today how you thought and what kind of emotions you went through will affect how you are tomorrow? Will it… will it or will it not? 
it will. So your karma won't wait till next lifetime. You are assuming too many things that you will have one more life. Without assumptions, if you look at it, every action that we do, the residual impact of that remains within us. Or in other words, when you perform physical, mental, emotional and energy activity, you are unconsciously building a software of your own. This both helps you and restricts you. On one level, because of certain type of thought and emotion and activity, you become geared to be able to do certain type of activity effortlessly. At the same time, that also becomes your limitation. So every karma that you perform, let's understand the word karma, karma means action. Nobody can live here without action. The moment you are born, action has begun, isn't it? Till you fall dead, action is on, on and on. Either conscious action or unconscious action is the only question, but action is always on. From today morning, since you woke up till this moment, how much of your mental karma are you conscious about? What do you think is a percentage? Believe me, it's well below one percent. So when ninety-nine percent of the karma is unconscious, obviously you think life is accidental. If you enhance the conscious karma from one percent to let's say three percent, suddenly you feel like you've been liberated because so many things are absolutely clear within you. So what you need to strive for is not worry about what will happen to you in your next life when you don't even know whether there's a next life. Whether there's a next life or not is just your belief. The reality is right now you're alive and the quality of your life is essentially decided by these four karmas. What kind of thought, what kind of emotion, what kind of physical action, what kind of energy action, is it not determining the quality of your life? Hello? Yes. So your karma is taking effect right now, not in next life. Right now it is taking effect. You are an engineer, means what? That is the karma you performed five years, you did karma, now you have it. Some people did not bother with the karma, they are not, they are something else. So, when you were sitting and doing the bad karma of studying for your examination, somebody who was partying thought you were stupid, yes? But after ten, twenty years, life shows up in a completely different way. Then people will realize, oh, I did… I did the wrong karma, now I should do the right karma, he did the right karma, so he got this. I'm saying, if you're conscious, if you're conscious of how your thought should be, how your emotion should be, how your action should be, this is not by some moral code, this is by the fundamental intrinsic nature of the human being. This is what I'm saying is the difference between morality and consciousness. Not because somebody told you, thou shall not kill this person, I'm not killing him right now. It never occurred to me that I have to kill him. Such… such teachings are not relevant to me because it never occurred to me that I have to rob what she's wearing, that I have to kill this man or I have to do something else to this person. This never occurred to me because I kept my human… humanity up all the time. If you let your humanity sleep, your memory sinks back into your evolutionary levels and you start behaving like a beast. But unfortunately, with an excessive intelligence for a beast, if you had the same intelligence that a snake has or a alligator uh, or a crocodile has, you wouldn't be so dangerous. You're okay, we know how to deal with you. But the problem is, with this level of intelligence which evolution has given you, now if you sink back to the level of unconscious that a crocodile is, that whatever it sees, it wants to snap, now you become quite a terrible possibility. So because evolution has pushed you up, it is time that you consciously keep yourself higher than your intelligence, do you understand? You must keep yourself above your intelligence. When you keep yourself above your intellect or your buddhi, then we say you are a buddha, that means you have become a dhada to your buddhi, that means you're above your buddhi, you have become a master of your intelligence. Only if you're a master of your intelligence, your intelligence will work for you. Otherwise, 
it could very easily work against you. When I say it works against you, you are… you are experiencing a little bit of stress right now. This means your intelligence is working against you. You are experiencing depression, your intelligence is working against you. You are experiencing fear, your intelligence is working against you because all these things, it is because of your intelligence you're creating these things. If I took away half your brain, you won't have stress, you won't have fear, you won't have nothing. So the problem is your brain. If we take away your brain, you will be fine, absolutely peaceful. Isn't it so? But that's not a solution. That is not a solution. So, you have already evolved into a certain level of intellect. The only way this intellect will function for your well-being and everybody's well-being is, you must be above that. If you really become above that, we say you are a Buddh Buddha. If you are in it, you are a non-stop suffering human being. Whatever happens, you will suffer. suffer Whatever does not happen, you will suffer. If you are below that, not too many problems, but then we call you buddhu. Thank you very much. We thank Sadhguru for this enlightening insight into our lives and well-being. We hope this session was a great insight and would help us in a holistic development. Thank you, Sadhguru. I would now request Director Professor Dr. Bhaskar Ramamurthy to felicitate our chief guest for the evening. I hope I'm not too… I'm not too abrasive for the institution. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I would also request Professor Dr. A. Thillai Rajan, Professor Dr. G. Srinivasan, and the Mills Committee members to please come up on the stage. Hello. Can I take just a minute to yes. tell them about the rally? The Rally for Rivers, as you know already, it's been happening, and uh, tomorrow morning we will be driving out of Tamil Nadu. Why this rally is, we must understand this that river is a concurrent subject in this country. That means the center and the state have to work together. When I was in Puducherry, the chief minister who was with us said, Sadhguru, almost exactly the same plan we had twenty-five years ago when I was in the Rajiv Gandhi government, but we could never get the concurrence of the remaining states, so it did not happen. So I told him, see, twenty-five years ago if you had done this, we wouldn't be where we are today and we could have done it with ten percent of the effort that we are putting in right now to make this happen. But now, fortunately, it is so that all the sixteen states, different political spectrum, people from different political parties, all of them are participating in the rally, which is a, a tremendous thing for the country. For the first time, there is concurrence. <laughs> the next. The next challenge is, even if we aggressively implement this policy, it will take ten to fifteen years of implementation and it needs enormous financial outlays and there are many complexities in execution. And if we implement this in fifteen years' time, it will take another five to ten years before we can see at least fifteen to twenty percent rise in the river flows. So this is a policy which is definitely not an election-winning policy. That is, no political party is too eager to make this because it's not something that will produce results immediately. Twenty-five years means four to five governments have come and gone. Many of the leaders who are today may not exist in twenty-five years' time. But to make a policy like that, it's important the people of this nation have to express that we have matured. We are not looking for freebies. If you do a policy which is for the long-term well-being of this nation and future generations, even if we have to go through a little bit of pain ourselves, we are willing to stand with you. If we do not make this statement in a big way, no democratically elected government will go for a policy 
which has so many complexities in implementation and a huge financial outlay and the results will come after twenty-five years. These things have not been done before. It is the responsibility of this generation that we make this happen. I want thirty crore people to give this missed call because thirty crore is forty percent of the electorate. If forty percent of the electorate gives a clear yes that this is what we want, no government can refuse. Please all young people, use your phones, use your social media to make this happen because if we don't do this one thing, believe me, I don't know how much you know about it, you can easily go on the net and read these things. The water situation in India is very dire. In Tamil Nadu, when we say river, generally people think only Kaveri, even that Kaveri, out of eight hundred and odd kilometers that it actually runs from Karnataka, only four hundred and thirty kilometers is in Tamil Nadu. This summer, for three and a half months, for three and a half months, the Kaveri dried up hundred and seventy kilometers inland, okay? Out of four hundred and thirty kilometers, one seventy kilometers it was bone dry. I want you to just make your own calculations, how long does it take before it doesn't enter Tamil Nadu. This is happening not just to one river, my engagement with mountains, forests and rivers is right from my childhood. Last twenty-five years I've been watching with concern the way the water levels are depleting. We have only twenty percent of the per capita water we had in 1947. And by 2025 they say we'll have only seven percent, particularly Tamil, the particularly Chennai, you must see this. Really, we have to watch out. You are living in a beautiful campus, the rest of the city is not like this. So, when you live in a beautiful place and the rest of the people live in a horrendous place, you are a danger. It is… it is not long before villages which lose complete water, there are many villages which have been vacated. When they vacate, the next thing is they may come and sit in IIT campus. Don't think police will be able to handle it. If they come in thousands, you cannot do anything. And I'm just talking about the civil strife that may happen in the country due to water shortage. Particularly in the last seven, eight years, I'm noticing the… the drop is so steep, it is super alarming the way the water levels are dropping. And there are many, many facts that you can… your young people, you can find out for yourself. But this is the time for us that we must stand up and make a clear statement. As citizenry of this nation, we have matured. We are ready for long-term policies, we are not waiting for freebies. Thank you very much. Kindly, if you could, everybody could pull their cell phones out and I will read out a number which Sadhguru just mentioned and we will have thousand, maybe two thousand missed calls at one time. So please, can we all do it together? Is everybody ready? So the number is eight triple zero nine. Again, eight triple zero nine. So the number is eight triple zero nine, eight triple zero nine. And just give a missed call, please.
सिंधु सरस्वती कावेरी जीवन कारण मूल तत्व नदी राष्ट्र से महामृत भारत Oh, oh, oh.